Everybody funnel in, get in your seats. We're jumping just right into the problem today. No intro. Here we go. A W14 by 109 steel column carries an axial load of 320 kips and a moment of 200 foot kips uh, about the Y axis. Uh, the center line of the anchor bolts is 1.5 inches outside the column flanges as shown. So they give us a nice little plan view of our base plate and our column, our wide flange column. Question. If a307 anchor bolts are used, which suck, but hey, to each their own. What size bolt is needed? Okay, there's our question. We're ready to go. Uh, I've already kind of preloaded the team today with uh, already a sketch right in front of us. So here is a kind of a side section view, if you will. If we were to take a view, AA, kind of something like that, that would be this sucker that we're looking at right here. That would be something very stereotypical that you would see in construction documents for um, exactly what this is for a, for a steel base plate connection to like a foundation, okay? Um, I've already called out one new dimension for us. So this guy right here, 14.3 inches is the depth of our steel column. So our wide flange W14 by 109. That you would go obviously to your steel manual. You go to the front chapter and you go to your lists of wide flange sizes and you just go to that and you'd grab your D value, that's all. We're not gonna go there right now, we're gonna keep on chugging. With the PE so close, that is already so ingrained in your head, I don't gotta go through that one. But if not, leave a comment and I'd be happy to go one-on-one -on -one with you, okay? So first off, we need to start by doing a little something like this. We have a moment and we have an axial load, which means that there's gonna be an eccentricity hanging around somewhere. Well, how do we represent that? We do just like this. We all remember that M over P equals E. That, when I was studying, came from learning how to do design of footings. So that carries all the way through into any other design that we're doing. It's the same, same equation, same principles behind it. So, M over P equals your eccentricity. Well, we have M, which is 200 kip feet. P is 320 kips. That gets us 0 0.625 feet. And if we multiply that to get it into inches, that's going to get us 7.5 inches. So what does that mean? Well, that means kind of the following. We can combine the axial load and the moment that's cranking on this column and re-represent that like this. I'm gonna go blue, and let's see. So, 7.5 inches, which means it's hanging out somewhere in this location. It's not quite to that outside anchor bolt, and it's not inside of the, uh, the column. So this is now our new P location, which represents both the axial load and the moment, okay? That, has a moment R or an eccentricity, right? We just call that E, of 7.5 inches. P is still going to equal 320 kips. Well, since we have, since our resultant is outside of the column flange, it means that we are introducing an eccentricity that is large enough that uh, that one of the anchor bolts, the, the opposite anchor bolt, this guy right here, will be experiencing uh, uplift and will be experiencing tensile stresses in the bolt. So. Lo and behold, we need to solve for that number, that tensile force that's acting on that anchor in order to size our anchor bolt. And that is our underlying problem. So how do we do that? Well, if I do the forces that are resisting uh, the demand, where do those come from? That comes from, you guessed it, a force couple deriving from tension on the outside anchor and compression on the inside anchor. Ho! Just kidding. We can't do that. That is a common misconception. It's not just between the two anchor points is your force couple. It is actually where, let's think about this, where would the compression uh, resultant be happening? It would actually be happening at the midpoint of the column flange. So this sucker right there. That is where your compressive force is going to be. Because if, if this whole thing was tipping sideways, it'd be pushing down into the base plate um, on that column flange. And then the next part, 
uh, would be lifting up and resisting overturning via a tension hold down, if you will, at that outside anchor bolt. So that distance here is your, is your force couple distance, okay? And if you're not quite following along, what I mean by force couple is that we, just in plain Jane English, make it as simple as possible, have some moment that's cranking about the center line of this column, and the way that we resolve moments is through a force couple. And a force couple happens between some distance, which is going to be, that's our distance, and then there's our counteracting forces. Okay? Because you have rotation, and then if you divide that by that distance d, that gets you your counteracting forces. Done and done. All right, let's jump back into it. Well, we could look about point A, about the center line, because we need to find that resultant force T. And we have all the forces that we need in front of us here, and we only need to solve for two more unknowns then. We can actually split up this distance into two separate distances. First one being, let's just call it D1 and D2. D1 is just going to be equal to uh, D, which is the depth of our column, over 2. That will get us that distance, plus 1.5 inches, because we know, if we scroll back up here, we know that it's typical 1.5 inches from the outside face of the column flange to the anchor bolt. So we tack that on, that would be D1. D, if we just plug in 14.3 inches, and that gets us D1 equaling 8.66 inches. D2 is D over 2, which we know. That gets us, let's scroll back up here, that distance again to the outside flange, but we need to get to the center line of the flange. So that means we actually need to subtract a little bit. So we need to subtract uh, the thickness of, whoops, the thickness of flange divided by 2. Thickness of flange can be found, again, in your AISC steel manual in the geometry section at the front with all of your wide flange uh, section sizes and all the geometries built in there. So the thickness of your flange is equal to 0 0.86 inches. And again, D is just 14.3. So all of that is going to equal 6.73 inches. So now we have both of these. So we have the distance component of our uh, resisting moments, if you will, and now we just need the force components of our counteracting moments. So how do we solve for those? We're going to do summation of moment when we're trying to find an unknown force. We could go ahead and say in our brains, uh, let's take summation of moment about point A. That's the center line of the column. That's a nice central location, and then we can just uh, you know, plug in all of the different forces and uh, eccentricities that are involved with this and get our solution. Not so fast. We're better than that. Remember, if we look here, and this is something that happens a lot in the PE exam. This is something, especially in review problems for the PE. So that's how you start to know that this is something that they throw at you. Let's go over here. If we were to take summation of moment about point A equal to zero, that would be P, 320 kips times an eccentricity of 7.5, and that is actually negative, because that is clockwise, plus C, that's counterclockwise, times D2, which is 6.73 inches, plus T, because again, that's counterclockwise, times D1, which is 8.66 inches. And that would be everything. And if you look, we have two unknowns. You might, when you're stressed for time and you're you know, sweating through your shirt, think that, well, compression and tension forces are just going to equal one another. That is not necessarily the case. So we don't want to make that assumption here. So you don't want to just go ahead and do that. So that means you have one unknown and two unknowns. We have two unknowns, so you're not going to be able to solve that equation. So that's not going to work out. Well, what do we do instead? 
with our summation of moments when we have two adones. We place our summation point at one of the unknowns. So instead of about the center line about A, get that freaking guy out of here, let's take it, uh, let's do it up top, sorry. Let's take it about our compressive point, okay, of our force couple. So let's call that point, uh, point C. We'll just call it point C for compression. Well, now that we do that, what's our, so if we cross this one out, what's our summation about point C equal to zero? Well, zero equals still the same thing, negative 320 kips times 7.5 from the eccentricity plus T times, but now your moment arm is this full length here, which is just D1 plus D2. So 8.66 inches plus uh, 6.73 inches. And then you still have C there, so plus C, but now its moment arm about itself, obviously, is just zero inches. So that cancels out. That leaves us with just one unknown, T. And that's what we're looking for in this case. Beautiful. So now we can solve. So if we solve all that out, T is going to equal 16 kips. Well, we ain't done yet because it told us to size the bolt in this case. So that is the tensile force that is pulling up, that's prying on that, uh, on that anchor bolt. Well, we are now going to need to flip over to our handy-dandy steel manual. This is going to be the 15th edition that we're moving over towards, and we're going to need to go to our bolt capacities for tension. See you over there. Here we are, table 7-2. I know you already have it tabbed for the PE exam, and if you don't already, what are you doing? Come on, look behind you. Everybody in the auditorium has a little tab in this section. Critical, this is critical. You're gonna be here a lot. So they talked about A307 bolts. They're absolute garbage, but we're using them. So, you know, to each their own. So we're gonna go down to our A307. Notice this is available tensile strength of a bolt because just up above here, one page before, is available shear for the same bolts and the tables look very similar. So do not mess that up. Star it, do whatever you gotta do to, to remind yourself that they're two different things and to double check yourself. And we had 16 kips and now you might be saying, whoa, wait a minute. All the way at the beginning, we didn't, we didn't apply load combinations. We didn't you know, determine ASD or LRFD. Today, they did not specify that and they did not even hint as to which one they might have wanted to use. Although I would design this for LRFD, uh, we today are going under the assumption of ASD. So just bear with me there. There's no rhyme or reason behind it, just for the fact that I'm gonna roll with that today. So 16 kips, assume that's allowable. ASD already factored all the way through, and we're gonna take an allowable capacity from our table here, okay? So we are at A307, and we need 16 kips. So let's see, if we go to one inch diameter bolts, ASD is 17.7 .7 kips of tensile capacity. That's greater than 16, so we're good there. <clears throat> one thing you will notice here, uh, if you have the earlier edition, if you have that 14th maroon edition, the capacities are slightly different. I'm not sure if it's in the tensile strengths, but I know in the shear strengths, there's actually some subtle differences. The strengths of the bolts have actually gone up in the new 15th edition uh, blue manual that I have in front of you right here. So some subtle differences. So when you're studying some older PDFs that reference maybe the maroon edition or even the black edition, they could be giving you solutions based on capacities of outdated bolts. So don't, don't freak out because you could spin your wheels forever being like, why is that like that? With each new addition, small things change here and there. And the strength of bolts has gone up over the years. That you could account for that from the, you know, the efficiency of the manufacturer and the way that they're able to control their, whatever, smelting and creation of the bolts. It's probably what it is. And there's now probably newer testing procedures that can prove the strength of the bolts from the factories. That's, that's going to be my best guess as to why that's happening. But again, 
I'm not totally positive, but I know that the strengths are going up for the bolts. One inch diameter, A307, RN omega equals 17.7 .7 kips, which is greater than T rec, we'll call it T required because we're going to assume ASD here, of 16 kips. So your answer is one inch diameter. Let's head back up to the top. One inch diameter. Oh, we don't want to go red here. Come on, we all know. Correct answers are green circles only. C is going to be our final answer. That's it for today. Like and subscribe to the video. Like and what? If you made it all the way through and you're feeling a little more confident about steel, like the video. Help a guy out. We're trying to get that new projector. We got that old little slide one, you know, where like you got to look behind you with the little filament pieces of clear paper. We still got that in here. We're trying to get some upgrades. So do your part if you're here and you got just that little taste of knowledge. Subscribe if you want to stick around and see that new projector when it comes out. Like the video if you haven't already, but only if you liked the content here today. And if you're part of the Brave Browser Crypto Society, we are a verified content creator with the Brave platform. Leave a tip if you'd like, and that'll about wrap it up. Doors are open. Get the hell out of this auditorium, and I'll see everybody next time. Later.